Hi, my name is Valerie. I'm one of the nurses in labor and delivery at the Brigham and Women's. I'm also one of the childbirth instructors here. Um, I've been a labor and delivery nurse for 39 years, and I'm hoping that I can impart to you some of what I've learned about labor and birth over the last 39 years. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping things. And I want to talk about the goals of the class. Uh, we're going to primarily talk about labor and birth. Um, you, I hope to give you a better understanding of the stages of labor, how you're going to cope with the pain of labor, and some of the normal postpartum changes. Before we begin, I want to make sure that we highlight a couple of things. First of all, I think it's very important for you to understand that our goal is healthy moms and healthy babies. Everything we do is with that in mind, and I'll refer to that several times through the class. If you have questions over the course of this class, write them down and you'll be able to submit them and one of us will be able to answer them uh, through an email. So write them down as we go along. Does everybody have a car seat? That's really important. Um, make sure you can install it uh, before you get to labor and delivery. Um, we don't check that installation at the hospital, but your fire, local fire station will often check it for you. If you're having a boy, make sure you discuss circumcision because the physicians will ask you about it after birth. And Pediatrician, it's very important that you have the name of a pediatrician when you come in. Um, a lot of them don't come to the Brigham and Women's, but we um, send the information on the baby's birth to the pediatrician so they have it before they see the baby the first time. Um, and finally, if you're not planning to take a tour at the hospital, you can do an online tour. It's under having a baby at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. One other thing I wanna um, bring up with you is that um, Brigham and Women's Dana Farber participates in the Duke University Carolina Cord Blood Bank. Um, it's something we're really proud of. Um, the flags and the stars on the map indicate places where we have um, had our cord blood that was donated used for stem cell transplants. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, all of the doctors in the group can collect at the time of your birth. Um, we can also um, uh, help you make arrangements, well, the, the cord blood bank can make arrangements to do a directed uh, cord donation for a current need. So if someone in your family currently needs stem cells, we can get in touch with the people who can make that happen. If you're interested in doing it, just let your labor nurse know. One of the things I would say um, at the beginning is um, communicate your preferences to us. Let us know what's important to you because we're here to help you have the most satisfying birth experience possible. And you know, we need your communication back and forth with us to make that happen. So things like um, feeding, if you're not breastfeeding, um, that's okay. We'll talk about it a lot, but um, just let us know in the beginning. Um, skin to skin, if you're not interested in having the baby skin to skin when it's all wet, let us know. We can take care of that. But those are things that we would normally do, but we want to meet your needs. So just communicate with your nurse. The main door of the hospital is at 75 Francis Street. It's a big um, circular door under a portico, and that's where you're going to start your journey with us. Um, it's very important, even if your partner is in active labor, you bring her there because they can get people upstairs um, the quickest possible. Um, the obstetric admitting office is right inside the door on the right under the escalator. And then they'll bring you up to the labor and delivery unit, which is on CWN5. Parking. Parking can be an issue. Um, but the best way, most of the time, is to use a valet. It's the cheapest, it's the quickest, you're not going to have to worry about um, getting her over to the hospital. So the valet, except on weekends, um, 
the corner garage is a little bit cheaper on, on weekends or is the same, but primarily use the valet. It's the best way to park. So what are you going to need for the hospital? Um, not a lot, honestly. Um, and particularly, you're not going to need a lot of things for labor and delivery, but we um, ha do have a list for you. I also recommend that you bring things that are just for labor to labor and delivery and leave things for postpartum in your car. You can go back and get them. Otherwise, if you move three or four times, there's a risk of losing things. There's not a lot of space. So leave suitcases, boppy pillows, car seats in the car until you're up on postpartum. Um, so the things that you would pack for labor, uh, you want to bring things like um, light snacks um, for you or your partner or both. Um, a big water bottle is a great idea. Long charging cords. Um, some of the outlets are not close to you, so having a long cord is a, a real benefit. Um, scrunchies or something that will keep your hair back out of your face is a great idea too. A lot of times people say, do I need to bring pillows? Um, you don't. We have a lot of pillows, but if there's one that really makes you feel comfortable, you can bring that in. Just don't bring it in a white pillowcase. Um, other things that you might bring are things that would make you feel comfortable. So if you like music, you can bring a Bluetooth speaker and play music. Um, if there's um, a special blanket you like, you can bring that too. But the idea is to bring things that would be comforting to you. For postpartum, you need um, a nursing bra. You need clothing for the baby to go home in and for you to go home in. And that would need to be, you know, season specific. Um, we have clothing, diapers, everything you need for you and your baby while you're in the hospital. So you really don't have to worry about that too much. So how many people can you have? You can actually have three labor support people with you in labor if you like. Um, these are not visitors. We don't have visiting on labor and delivery. Um, your visitors would see you when you get to the postpartum floor and the visiting hours in the hospital um, are technically one to nine. Uh, but the three support people, if you had a doula, that would count as one of the support people, and then um, two others. And the expectation is that they are there to support you. Um, they wouldn't be coming and going from the room a lot. Um, and um, they wouldn't be waiting out in the waiting area on the fifth floor. If they leave the area, they'll go down to the first floor of the CWM lobby. Um, so give it, a, give it some thought. Um, and you can let us know when you get to the hospital. There's no pre-arrangements that need to be made. So there's some general things I want to talk about um, regarding labor. And one of them is the issue of control. Um, we're strong, powerful women. We're used to, you know, getting things done, doing things on our timeline. Uh, labor is not like that. Labor has its own timeline, and even those of us who think we know what it's about don't always, um, can have a big impact on it. So labor is a very primal um, experience in your body, um, and we can do things to help it along, but we're definitely not in charge of it. Um, and I, I would say too, the work of the first stage of labor is just distraction. Basically, you just need to get through it until you're fully dilated and you can then do something with your labor. So the first stage of labor is divided into three phases. Um, the early phase of the first stage of labor can take up to 20 hours. That's when your cervix is going to probably close to about four to five centimeters open your contractions are going to, at this point, increase in frequency and duration and intensity. That's a hallmark of labor. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, one of the things that's important at this point is for you to make note of when your contractions start. And then what I want you to do is I want you to forget about them. Because believe me, nobody ever slept through their 
their first labor. And if it's not catching your attention, then chances are not a lot is happening to your cervix. We'll talk more about that when we get to how to tell um, uh, pre-labor contractions from labor contractions. But um, important to just know that distraction and getting through is the job of the or the goal of the first stage of labor. I want to at this point just talk a little bit about the role of the partner. I'll bring that up again later. But I just want to say to partners, it's really hard to watch someone you love that's in pain. And a lot of times um, you don't know what to do. And what I would say is the most important thing for you to do is to be with her. Your presence is very powerful and it means an awful lot to her. You know her better than anyone and it's important to use that knowledge and just help her. But your presence is the most important thing. Um, you, it's important that you know what to expect um, and you can you know, help her communicate things that um, she wants or doesn't want um, with her providers. So that's an important role for you. Um, be ready to wait. Labor is not short. The movies make it look that way, but it's not. The average length of labor in a first time mom can be up to 24 hours. So um, be prepared to wait. Be flexible. Her needs may change with every contraction. Um, don't take anything personally. One of the other rules I have is don't say relax. <laughs> um, you can say things like drop your shoulders, open your hips, fingers long, but relax is something the brain has to process. Whereas if you give her muscle instructions, it's much easier for her to, to deal with those. Okay, let's talk about um, the next phase of the first stage of labor. Okay. So after the early phase is the active phase. Now things are really getting started at this point. Your, the dilation of your cervix is gonna occur about a centimeter an hour. This is the time when you go from about five to six centimeters to about seven to eight. Your contractions are going to make you more breathless. They stop you in your tracks. Um, it's harder to rest between them. You might have an urge to bear down or you may feel pressure in the front of your pelvis. From this, again, this is this baby moving down through this, um, the pelvis. Your contractions are definitely gonna be more frequent and they will be more painful. The next phase of the first stage of labor is called transition. And that's taking you from about seven to eight centimeters to fully dilated. This is what I like to refer to as the heartbreak hill of labor and delivery. You can see the, the end is coming, but you still have a bit of work to do. The good news is it's probably the fastest phase of the first stage of labor. Um, your dilation is going to occur more rapidly at this point. Um, you may feel like you don't want to continue. I, I often see that with women who don't have anesthesia. They'll say, I want to go home. I want to stop. Um, and so you check them and lo and behold, they're fully dilated and then they don't have to do it for a lot longer. So very, very distinct change in um, a laboring woman's behavior at this point. If that, up to this point you've had natural childbirth, um, sometimes this is a time when women reconsider that um, and think about pain management. The other thing I would say about uh, that is, um, if I ask any woman in the middle of a contraction if she wants pain relief, she's gonna tell me yes. So what I suggest is that you have kind of a phrase or a signal for your partner that when you say that, you really mean it. You really want um, to have pain relief. Okay, so one of the hardest things is to figure out when you're actually in labor, right? So you've probably heard of Braxton Hicks, false labor, true labor. 
I want you to forget all of that and just break it up into pre-labor contractions and labor contractions. And the bottom line is pre-labor contractions do not change your cervix, labor contractions do. There are some distinct differences between them and it will help you to know whether or not you're in early labor. In pre-labor contractions, the uterus can be tight at the top or at the bottom or um, in different places. In labor, the uterus contracts over the entirety of it. So that's a way, if you're only feeling your contractions down here, probably not labor. Uh, Pre-labor contractions also don't cause a lot of back pressure. Um, that is a hallmark of labor though. So that big powerful baby being pushed down, giving pressure to your backbone can give you that back pressure. You can also feel it in your lower abdomen. Pre-labor contractions don't follow that pattern that we talked about. They don't necessarily get longer, stronger, and closer together. They may come and go. Um, they may be getting closer together, but they're not getting stronger. Or they're a little stronger, but they're still 10 or 20 minutes apart. So those are pre-labor contractions. Labor contractions get longer, stronger, closer together over time. Uh, Pre-labor contractions may stop if you change your activity, like if you take a bath or you go for a walk. That's not the case with labor contractions. These generally are not going to stop when you um, change your activity. And in fact, taking a walk may make them stronger. And again, the bottom line is, pre-labor contractions are not causing your cervix to change. Labor contractions are causing your cervix to thin and open. So the bottom line is, how are, how are you gonna know it's labor? They're gonna, these contractions will take your breath away. They're gonna stop you in your tracks. You're not able to walk or talk through them. You really have to stop where you are and just experience the contraction. Another thing you may notice is a bloody show. Now, a bloody show is different than a mucus plug. Now, you may lose your mucus plug and it may be 10 days, two weeks before you go into labor. So you losing your mucus plug is not a sign of labor, but a bloody show is. And the difference is that you have mucus with streaks of pink or red or brownish um, bleeding. Now this is different than bright red bleeding, like a period. That is never normal in pregnancy. If you experience that, we need you to call right away. But a bloody show comes from the fact that your cervix is a mucous membrane and your mouth is a mucous membrane. So imagine that if you stretched it, it would bleed. And that's what's happening to your cervix and that's why you have that bloody show. And that's what makes it a sign of labor because something is starting to happen to that cervix. In addition, you may break your water. So those, those are the ways that you're going to be able to determine whether or not it's labor. So a lot of times women will ask, when do we call? When do we call the office and let them know that we think we're in labor? Well, first of all, we want you to call anytime you're, you have questions or concerns. We don't want you sitting at home worrying about something, not sure if it's, it's important. If you're worrying about it, we want you to give us a call. There's a nurse on call 24 hours a day. Someone can talk to you. Um, that being said, we have a little, pattern we call 511. This is when your contractions are five minutes apart or less. They last for at least a minute and that's been going on for about an hour. So that's the 511. That's probably the beginning of labor and you'll want to give us a call at that point. Some other times when you will we want you to call are if you recognize that um, the baby's not moving as much as normal. Now this is hard because um, at the end of pregnancy, the baby's running out of real estate. So they don't generally move as much as they might have before. But every baby has its busy time of the day. So what I'm talking about is during that busy time, if you notice that the baby is moving less, I want you to do the following. Have something to eat or drink, sit down or lie down and put your hands on your belly. A lot of times there are movements that you can feel more distinctly when your hands are actually on your belly, and that can be reassuring. And we expect that you'll have 10 movements in two hours. 
If you don't, give us a call. Probably want to see you to evaluate the baby further. Now, um, another time when we want to hear from you is anytime you feel like you're having contractions and you are less than 37 weeks pregnant. And that means even if you're 36 weeks and six days, if you think you're having contractions um, that are regular, do not wait for this 511. We want to hear from you sooner rather than later. The uterus is the best incubator and we like to keep the babies in until they're ready. So um, we want to hear from you if you think you're having contractions before 37 weeks. The bright red bleeding that I talked about is another time when we want to hear from you. Also, if you break your water, whether or not you have contractions, um, there is a little bit of a clock that gets running once your water breaks. We like you to be kind of in labor within about 24 hours of that. So it's a good idea for you to call and let us know. Um, sometimes we need to figure out if your water really did break or not. So let, giving a call is, is uh, very helpful in that regard. Now, if you are group B strep positive, that's what GBS is. Um, that's a test that's done around 36 weeks. Group B strep is a bacteria that's a normal uh, flora of the vagina. Many women have it. It's not a problem for them. Um, but it can be a problem for newborns. So we test for it. And if you are group B strep positive and you broke your water, we want to hear from you right away because we're going to start giving you some antibiotics to prevent transmission of the group B strep to the baby. And again, anytime you need reassurance or you're scared. Now, you might be seen here in the office or you could be seen at the Brigham and Women's in the triage area. Um, so either one of those are a possibility. Now you've probably heard a lot of things about labor. Um, and what we like to address is some of these things that may or may not happen to you and talk about the things that are more likely or less likely that you might experience. Now one of them, this could be a little surprising, is that your water may break before you go into labor. In fact, only about 10% of women break their water before they go into labor. So that's really just a possible. Diarrhea and nausea. Now that's, that's a, a probable. And the reason why, um, first of all, the nausea can come from the fact that when you go into labor, um, your GI tract kind of shuts down. Nothing goes very far. Um, so you can have nausea from that. And diarrhea can come from just the stimulation of the bowel by this contracting uterus. Now, towards um, the second stage of labor, it's not uncommon for women to have nausea and vomiting. And it's kind of mother's, mother nature's way of getting you ready for labor because pushing and retching are very much the same. So um, those are both probable. Bloody show and mucus plug we talked about. Um, you likely will see a bloody show when you're in labor. You may or may not notice that you've lost your mucus plug. Antibiotics. You will get antibiotics if you are group B strep positive. Another time when you might get them is if you develop the fever in labor. Um, and then epidurals. About 85% of the patients at the Brigham and Women's do get epidurals for labor. Now, sometimes people think that's the only way we do labor. That's not true. Um, we do labor however you want to do labor, um, but we do have a good anesthesia team and a lot of women do come to us because of that. So the rate is about 85%. Some other possible or probable um, is induction. And now an induction of labor is um, definitely a possible. Um, and there are a lot of factors, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but induction is bringing on labor where it doesn't already exist. So that's definitely a possibility. Feeling an urge to push, definitely. And that comes from this big baby being pushed against your rectum and stimulating the same nerves that are stimulated when your bowel is full. So most women do get an urge to push, uh, even if they have anesthesia. Okay, this one is a little surprising maybe, 
only about 3% of babies are born on their due date. So remember we talked about those, the psyche. Um, I have a, a suggestion for you um, that relates to that. And it has to do with the fact that women get to their due date and they feel like that's the end. And in fact, a due date is really a due range. Um, you know, babies don't know that it's time to be born um, and they come out when they're ready and we like them to come out when they're ready. So what I want you to do, I know this is hard, but I want you to just add seven to 10 days to your due date, make it a range. And that goes to the psyche thing, because if you get to that point where you're, you're at term and you expect labor to be over, it can be very frustrating and discouraging to not be in labor, but it's okay because babies will come when they're ready for the most part. So um, the other thing is that babies can be born, as we said before, preterm, which is less than 37 weeks, or they can be born after their due date up to about 41 weeks. Usually we're not going beyond 41 weeks of pregnancy. So induction of labor. That's again, bringing on labor where it doesn't exist already. Now there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, and some of them include um, spontaneous rupture of the membranes. Um, so that's where you break your water. And let's say you're group B strep positive um, and you break your water. That definitely would be a um, time that we might induce your labor. Or let's say you broke your water but your contractions haven't really progressed. That's another time when we might um, induce your labor. Um, advanced maternal age. So if you are approaching 40, um, often we will induce your labor. Um, if you go beyond uh, 40 weeks up, to, you know, approaching 41 weeks, another time we might induce labor. And again, anytime the health of the mom or the baby is at risk, if the pregnancy continues. So let's say the mother had high blood pressure during her pregnancy. Um, the, the best treatment for that is delivery. So we might induce your labor for that. Um, in, in, on the side of the baby, let's say the baby stops growing. Uh, it's grown normally and all of a sudden, um, over a couple of weeks, the growth falls off. That might be a time to induce your labor. Um, Dr. Bunnell has a video that goes into how we um, induce labor some of the ways we do cervical ripening, and um, you can access that. In addition to augmenting your, or uh, inducing your labor with Pitocin, which is um, the major drug we use, it, we also might augment your labor with Pitocin. So let's say your cervix has been dilating and you get to six centimeters and you don't make progress from that point on. It would not be unusual for us to give you Pitocin to help get your contractions stronger and augment your labor. Um, now, I know a lot of, there's a philosophy out there, a lot of people say don't talk about pain, um, talk about tightenings or waves. I would rather have you pleasantly surprised um, than to come back to me and say, God, you never said it was gonna be like this. So I, I would never say that labor isn't painful. Remember, it's this big muscle um, doing a lot of work. And there are different ways that we're gonna cope with, with this pain. Um, early, especially at home, things like relaxation techniques, if you do yoga or meditation, those things can be very helpful. Um, hydrotherapy, and what I mean by that is showers or baths, um, and breathing patterns. I don't go into breathing patterns a lot because honestly, your body has responded to changes in workload um, in a respiratory fashion your entire life. In other words, you breathe differently at the bottom of a flight of stairs than you do at the top. And my job is to really take that pattern that you have and make it work for you. So. Although there are certain breathing patterns, um, we can help you in a, to breathe um, and learn those patterns or work with those patterns that you already have. 
Um, we talked a little bit about the role of the partner um, and the labor support people. The most important thing to remember is that they are there to support you. Um, and if things are not working, um, especially for other labor supports, um, and you need us to help you with that, that's one of our roles. You are our prime focus as our labor patient. You and your uh, baby are our primary uh, focus. So if you need help with that, let us know. Um, but the, role, the partners in labor support can help you with things like um, a light touch that's called effleurage, um, which can be uh, soothing or rubbing your back putting pressure uh, low in the back um, can give you some relief uh, from back pain. Those are the kind of things that your partner or your labor supports can help you with. In addition to that, in the hospital, um, we, there are some medications that we use. Um, the first is a narcotic. Um, some, we used to use Nubane. Uh, currently, it's out of stock. We're using a drug called Stadol. They're very similar. Um, they, um, we give them in two doses, IV and IM, and often we'll give them with um, a drug like Phenergan, something that's gonna um, help with nausea, that kind of thing. Um, so you would have an IV at this point. Um, we give the divided dose because the IV medication takes effect fairly quickly, but doesn't last very long. The IM dose, lasts a bit longer, but it takes a while to start. Generally, you get relief for anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half, usually not more than that. And the medication usually only works well the first time. And that's probably because labor is dynamic, so what works down here is not gonna work up here. In addition to that, we um, have nitrous oxide or laughing gas available on the floor. Um, this is something that you would administer to yourself through a mask. Um, it's in and out of your body very quickly, so it's a great option. Um, you put the mask on when you start to feel the contraction and take it away when the contraction's over. Now, both the, the medication and the nitrous oxide can make you feel uh, a little loopy, um, a little um, uh, dizzy, that kind of thing. And some people don't like that feeling. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, they, the nitrous can sometimes cause some nausea. Actually, the, the new vein can as well, or the statol. Um, so just be aware of that too. And then um, the major pain relief that we have is the epidural. Um, and a lot of times when women will say, when can I have my epidural? So is it ever too early or too late? So as long as it's quicker to have the epidural than the baby, it's not too late. In terms of too early, we do want you to be in labor, um, making some change. Um, obviously, if you're being induced, that might have an effect on that, but um, we'd like you to be in labor, having regular painful contractions. And basically, I like to um, say, if you feel like your pain's on a scale of zero to 10, up around a seven, it's probably the time for your epidural. There's no right or wrong time, really. Another question women have is, will it slow down my labor? Um, the research shows that in fact, the women that have epidurals and don't, if you look at them over time, um, equal groups, it's a, it does lengthen your labor by about a half an hour. Now we would never do something differently for a half an hour. So even though it, there is a difference, we call it not clinically significant. Um, will it cause me to have a C-section? So again, this is a little tough. Um, in general, if you look at two groups of women, uh, equal groups, um, there is not an increased rate of cesarean. However, what I would say is, remember we talked earlier about how this baby, when it's coming through the pelvis in this position, it's a harder labor. So 
it can be a more painful labor. So it may cause you to get an epidural, and it is also one of the major causes of cesarean section. So was the painful labor contributing to um, the epidural and then the C-section? It's hard to know. We can't ever go back and look at that, but it is a confounding factor. But generally, two groups of women, not an increase in C-section if they were in labor to start. Um, can you push your baby out if you can't feel things? Bottom line is you will be able to feel things. The um, mix of medication that we use at this point is um, gives you good sensory relief, but um, doesn't create a big motor block. So you can move around a lot and you will be able to feel that sensation of needing to push. All right, let's talk about the second stage of labor now. You've gotten to fully dilated. You're in the second stage of labor. Now, um, this is a time when you can really work with your labor. So with the first stage, it's all about getting through it, just being distracted, getting to fully dilated. Now you can actually work with your labor. So the second stage is from that point of being fully dilated until the birth of the baby. Now we measure the um, progress of the baby through the pelvis um, to get an idea how it's progressing. And we do that uh, by using the little, these little bony prominences that are in the pelvis. And we measure um, the progress by um, if the baby's head is at the level of the um, spines, we call it a zero station. If it's above that, it's a minus station. And if it's a below that, it's a plus station. And birth or crowning is about plus four. So that gives us a way to know that the baby is moving through the pelvis. Now, sometimes we'll check you and you'll be fully dilated and we'll say, okay, have a little bit of a nap. And you're like, what? Um, we do sometimes have women do something called laboring the, the baby's head down. And what I mean by that is that we want the baby to get to about a plus two station on the pelvic floor. Um, and the uterus can do a lot of that work, pushing the baby straight into the pelvis. And what we found is if, if we let you um, labor the baby's head down to the uh, pelvic floor, you have less exhaustion, you have more power to get, do the hard work of getting this baby the rest of the way through the perineum and out. So someone may suggest that to you. Now in a first, uh, first time mom, pushing can take anywhere from two to four, five hours, generally somewhere around two to three hours. Um, it's definitely less for the second baby Second babies should always be first. Um, we use different positions for pushing. Now, a lot of times women will say to me, squatting is the best position. And that's true. Squatting opens up your pelvis. It's kind of a straight shot. Um, so sometimes people will want to sit up in, in the bed. And sometimes I'll say, no, let's lie down. And the reason is that um, squatting and sitting are very different. But if you think about lying down, um, there's more of a straight shot through your pelvis than if you are bent over the pelvis. So those are the kind of position changes we might suggest or use through um, pushing. Um, so the baby is gonna gradually work its way down through the pelvis. At first, we don't see a lot. The baby kind of takes two steps forward, one step back. And it's a rocking motion that starts to dilate the tissue of your vagina. And that, that tissue needs to dilate as well. It's never been stretched before. So that rocking motion of the baby coming through the pelvis helps to dilate that. Um, it also, at, when you begin to crown, will thin out the tissue of your perineum. So the baby's gonna get to about that plus four station and the doctor will say, um, stop pushing or give me a gentle push or um, give me a cough sometimes. And with that, the baby's head comes out. Once the head is out, we check for 
a cord around the baby's neck. So we might say, stop pushing for a minute, reduce that, push it over the baby's head and ask you to give another push and the rest of the baby comes out. The obviously the head is, you know, a, much harder to come out than these soft shoulders. So there's a real difference. Now we do put uh, baby skin to skin. Um, so we'll, and wait for the umbilical cord to stop pulsing about a minute. And um, partners, we encourage partners to participate by cutting the umbilical cord. Um, when you do that, it's, uh, it's kind of like a rubber hose. There's no nerve endings. You're not gonna hurt mom, you're not gonna hurt baby, but it is a little bit tougher than you might think. It's kind of like a rubber hose. Now, um, once the baby comes out, and we don't do episiotomies very often, only if the baby needs to be delivered in a timely fashion. Um, but most women for first time baby do have some kind of tears, um, either of the vagina or um, the perineum. And after the baby's been born, um, we'll start to repair those. A lot of times for women will say, how many stitches is it? It's not really countable. It's you know one long stitch. It's kind of like a blanket stitch. So we'll do that repair after the baby's born and often before the placenta is delivered. Now we get to the third stage of labor and that's the delivery of the placenta. Now this can take up to 30 minutes from the time the baby's born. Um, and we'll, as I said, we'll do that repair if you need one. We keep an eye on you for bleeding at this point. Um, and the reason we do that is um, the placenta is attached to the wall of the uterus and when the baby's born, the uterus clamps down and sometimes that stimulates the placenta to start peeling away. Now, occasionally it will peel away but not all the way. And these blood vessels that are feeding the placenta that are now exposed can um, cause a fair amount of bleeding. So we keep a close eye on that um, as we're waiting for the placenta. So then the uterus will clamp down, the placenta peels away, and maybe you give a push, maybe not. It's much easier than the baby to deliver this placenta. Um, so that's the third stage of labor. All right, let's talk about the fourth stage of labor now. Um, now this is the time from the birth of the baby through the first two hours. Um, and that's a time that you'll spend with us in labor and delivery. And we call these the golden hours. And we call them that because it's a very precious time. Um, it's a unique time for the baby because the baby's in a very hyper alert stage and a state and the baby is taking in, imprinting the sounds, the smells, and um, it's a great time for bonding. And we do a lot of skin to skin at this point. We initiate feeding, whether breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Um, and um, way back when, when we first started doing skin to skin, one of the nurses who was teaching us said, babies crawl to the breast. And I said, babies don't crawl to the breast. Babies do crawl to the breast. It's pretty amazing. They gradually work their way to the breast and they will start suckling. We generally do encourage you to start breastfeeding within that first hour, towards the end of that first hour, um, and we'll help you with that. Um, now, if you're bottle feeding, that's time to do that as well. Um, and the skin to skin is important for the baby for a variety of reasons. We, we know that skin to skin contact um, promotes um, the regulation of the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and the breathing pattern of the newborn. So it's a really important time for them. Um, one thing I would mention is skin to skin is not sex dependent. Partners can do um, skin to skin as well. So um, if mom is tired, she's been in labor for a while, if, she, if she's not done or she's all done skin to skin, partners can do that as well. Same benefits. Um, 
Generally, we dry the baby off once the baby's on your chest. Um, we also, um, at this point, give the baby a certain medications. We give vitamin K, erythromycin ointment, and a later on we'll give hepatitis B vaccine. We give all the three of those in labor and delivery. Um, and the most important thing is to, in, from the psyche point of view, recognize that this is a time for you. This is your family beginning. And so that's why we look at it from a very, um, the perspective of being very precious as well. So we're here to support you in that as well. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about cesarean birth. Now, cesarean birth is a birth of a baby through an incision in the lower abdomen and the lower part of the uterus. Now, this is another one of those psyche things that I want you to think about. Um, none of us want you to have a cesarean section. We only do them when we need to. But more importantly, everybody is at risk. And the saddest thing I've ever seen is someone who has a plan for their labor and it doesn't work out and they're having a cesarean and the baby is born and they are crying because they are, they feel like they failed. Labor and birth is about the outcome, not the process. So from a psyche point of view, what I'd like you to do is just close your eyes and consider yourself on that OR table. I don't want you to obsess about it, but I do want you to consider that it is a possibility. Everyone is at risk. So what are some of the reasons why we might do a cesarean? Um, first of all, anytime the well-being of the mom or the baby is um, in question, so let's say, again, the mother develops some hypertension or maybe she develops a fever. For the baby, perhaps the baby's not tolerating labor. Um, the baby has to be born somehow. So if you aren't progressing in labor, or if the baby's not tolerating labor, or your dilation stops, those are all reasons why you might need to have a cesarean. It also can occur in the second stage of labor. So for whatever reason, this baby is not getting through the pelvis. So remember we talked about the occiput posterior position being one of those times. We call that a rest of descent, and that might be an indication for a cesarean as well. So the baby size, position, the pelvic size, all those things we talked about in the beginning of the factors that influence labor play a part here. So I don't want you to worry about it, but I do want you to at least know that it is a possibility. So, Let's talk about postpartum now. Um, the length of stay in the hospital is two nights for vaginal delivery or 48 hours. Um, we don't send people home after eight o'clock at night. So if you deliver your baby at 8.30, you would stay an extra night. Um, and it's four nights or 96 hours for a cesarean. Some of the things that you're gonna experience over those first few days, you're going to have a vaginal flow or bleeding for the first few weeks, actually up to about six weeks. It does change from bright red to brown to pink to a whitish to possibly a clear discharge, but you will have some kind of discharge. In labor and delivery and for the first 24 hours, we, re we recommend ice packs to your bottom to prevent some of the swelling, minimize it. Something I want you to make sure that you get when you're on postpartum is, is something called a sitz bath. Now, a sitz bath is um, it's kind of uh, like a portable bidet. It's a pan that sits in the toilet and it has a bag attached to it with tubing and you put warm water in the bag and the tubing um, the sprays onto your bottom. It's great for comfort, for cleaning your perineum, um, for healing, really important. So make sure that you get one of those and take it home with you. Um, other things that are really important in the postpartum period are things like hydration. Um, breastfeeding takes a lot of fluids. You've expended a lot of fluids through labor. So hydration is important. Partners can help with that by every time you're breastfeeding, bring you a big glass of something to drink. 
Um, in addition, ambulation is important. We want you to get out of bed and be moving. Um, we don't want you to develop clots in your legs. Um, and though getting up the first time can be hard, um, it, is, it gets progressively better. Um, the more you get up and move, the easier it is. So we recommend that you're up and moving. Um, if you have a cesarean, that's gonna be several hours and the nurses will help you with that upstairs. But um, once you're able to ambulate, your epidural, epidural is fully worn off. If you had one, um, we recommend ambulating as much as you can. Another thing that um, is important uh, in the postpartum period is something called the baby blues. Now, you've been pregnant for nine months, your hormones have gotten up here, you have a baby, the hormones drop. Um, so that causes a state of kind of hyper emotion. So you cry easily or um, you're sad. Now this is something that lasts for the first few days, possibly up to a week. Um, but it's very common, almost every woman experiences it. It is not abnormal. Um, so you can expect that. That's different though than something called postpartum depression. Now, postpartum depression is something that lasts longer than that time where you might have the baby blues. And it's behavior outside the range of your normal behavior. Let's say you're very social and suddenly you don't want to see people or you withdraw or you're not interested in the baby. That would be some signs of postpartum depression. And, um, it's very treatable, and I recommend that you contact the office um, or your care providers um, to get some support and help for that because it's very treatable. Partners have a part to play here because you know her better than anyone, and you can help her recognize that this behavior is outside of the normal range of her behavior. You'll, you'll be offered an appointment for two weeks, uh, but generally you're full postpartum visit is at six weeks, um, and that would be here in the office. So we know about the three trimesters of pregnancy, but there's also a fourth trimester. And it's, you know, the first 12 weeks after you have a baby. Um, and the effects, you know, it took you a while to get to the stage of having your baby, you know, over pregnancy, a lot of changes to your body. Um, and those don't go away quickly. They, um, the getting back to normal can take up to three months. Um, these would be physical, emotional, and psychological changes. Um, part of it is that your family is becoming um, a family and there are changes there. Um, so it's important to remember that there will be changes related to pregnancy that will go on for up to three months. Your body doesn't change quickly. It took you a long time to get there, so be patient and know that it does take time. There are some postpartum warning signs that I want to share with you. Make sure you're aware of partners um, as well as um, our moms. Um, things like shortness of breath or um, if you develop pain in your chest, um, if you are fainting or if you have a seizure. Um, a headache that doesn't respond to medications, especially if there's some visual changes, spots in front of your eyes or blurry vision. Um, these are really important signs that you would want to contact the office about. Um, other signs would be bleeding. Let's say um, you're soaking through a padded hour or you have clots, um, especially if they're the size of an egg or bigger. Um, also, women sometimes can develop an infection and there would be an odor to their discharge. So those are things we would want to see you about or talk with you about at least. So give a call to the office. Um, if you develop a temperature of 100.4 or greater and that's consistent over um, retaking it over the course of a um, couple of hours and it, it's still elevated, we would want to hear from you. If you have an incision or, or uh, uh, repair, perineal repair that is not healing. We would want to hear from you. And anytime you might have redness or swelling in a leg, um, especially if it's warm or tender to touch, that's also another postpartum warning sign. We want to hear from you if you have any of these. 
Um, we also have lactation support. Breastfeeding is not easy. You know, you've never done it before. The baby's never done it before. It can be challenging. And it's important to get good help and support. Um, and if you're having issues um, with breastfeeding, Jen Harper is a nurse practitioner here. She does a lot of work with breastfeeding, lactation, counseling, and support. If you're having issues, I highly recommend giving her a call. Um, you can talk with her over the phone or have an appointment. She also has some classes um, that are very valuable. Um, often there are also lactation consultants um, in the community that can serve as a resource for you, but get help. Um, because it is a challenge sometimes and support is the best thing you can do for yourself. There are additional resources you might um, look for in your community. Um, things like fourth trimester classes or mommy and me. Um, those can be a really uh, beneficial um, experience for talking to other new moms. So um, most communities have those. I recommend that you look into those now. Um, and. Um, they can be very helpful in looking at sleeping and feeding and, and just support in general. So look for those resources in your community. So my last point is really my first. Um, be flexible, be open-minded, and communicate with your care providers and your partners. And that's the way you're going to have the most satisfying birth experience. And we're here to support you in that. And my friend Renee and I wish you the best of luck.